On this episode of This Week in Space, we're talking about amazing space podcasts besides our own and the awesome space hipsters. Stay with us. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is This Week in Space, episode number 116, recorded on June 21st, 2024. Spreading the good word. Hello and welcome to another episode of This Week in Space, the Spreading the Good Word edition. I'm Rod Pyle, Editor-in-Chief, Badass Magazine, as if you don't know that. And I'm here, as always, with Tarek Malik, the inelegant Editor-in-Chief of <laughs> Space.com. How are you, my friend? Inelegant? I am a ballerina on my toes, uh, Rod. Ew. <laughs> Well, you're framing that up. All right. And we're going to be joined in a little bit by our guest today, Emily Carney, who is a writer, podcaster, and chief space hipster at Space Hipster over on Facebook, which is a group over there of about 62,000 people, which you ought to check out. And her partner on her podcast, Dave Giles, who is also a podcaster and a premier musician. And their podcast is called Space and Things. And I encourage you to check it out under the condition that you continue to listen to this one. And before we start, of course, don't forget to do us a solid. Make sure to like, subscribe, and all the good podcast things on the podcast service of your choice, wherever you listen to us. And now, drum roll, please. A space joke from listener Michael Garrison, who actually just forwarded this from a publication called The Needling, which I hadn't heard of before. The Needling's headlines, kind of like The Onion, I think. Their headline for the week was, Boeing to leave Starliner in space to prove it can still make things that don't fall out of the sky. <laughs> Ouch. All right. Uh, well, thank you for that, Michael. Keep them coming. Save, save us from ourselves and yourselves and send us your best work or most of the different space joke to twist at twit.tv. That's T-W-I-S at twit.tv because we, we need your jokes. Otherwise, you have to listen to mine. All right. Now... Let's go to some headlines. Speaking of Starliner. That's right. It seems to That's be right. hanging around a little longer than planned, eh? Yeah. So um, so Starliner is now like in its uh, uh, approaching its third week of its eight day mission, I think, uh, if, <laughs> if uh, memory serves, mm. uh, because this week NASA and Boeing agreed to extend the mission to June 26th, actually. Uh, so this is the third extension, right? That's right. That's right. They had uh, they were aiming at the twenty second for a while. Uh, before that, they they were they were initially aiming for like about of a week or so uh, of an initial flight of eight days. It was the initial one, um, but they want to get a, a handle on those um, those leaks and those thruster issues that they've been looking at for a while. They want to test the thrusters while they're docked at the station, uh, and they want to understand that everything will be okay after they undock for the trip back to earth. Uh, and so, uh, so they've set, and it's a really early morning landing. They've, they've set a, uh, an undocking for June 26th and then it would land, uh, at, um, 451 Eastern time in the morning at white sands, uh, space Harbor on that day at, uh, in New Mexico. So, mm. uh, so that's where things are now. Now it is, uh, as you and I are recording this a Friday, it is, uh, 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 in the afternoon. And usually if they're going to make an announcement to change anything, it will come around six o'clock today. So we're waiting to find out if this June 26th, uh, date's going to stick or if we're going to get, uh, uh, another extension, if they need more time to understand all of this, but, um, but you know, they're, they're trying to figure out everything. And then what we did hear this week, Rod, is that no matter what, what happens, they will not require like a second crew flight test before the Starliner one operational, mission which is slated for early 2025 they're just going to take a look at you know what happened on this mission uh figure out you know how to make any tweaks for the thrusters that they can and then uh and then do that for the next mission itself so uh but that's kind of where things are as we speak the mission continues for starliner so for the first american spacecraft under parachutes anyway not counting the shuttle to come back to dry land they're going to be doing it in the dark huh yeah, well, you know, it, it, it's an interesting approach. And if memory serves, at least one of the uncrewed test flights land in the dark. Uh, so they've had right. some experience, you know, I with that. First crewed, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so this will be the first oh. crewed one. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see how it all turns out. Now, not, uh, they, that could always change. They, 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 they could always tweak yeah. the approach. They've got some few hours of 
of of wiggle room as I understand it, but we'll have to see how how it shakes out uh, next week. Actually, as we're once, recording, if if I was in their seat, once I undock, I'd want to have the least amount of time requiring work on thrusters I could. But exactly, it's just me. All right, next up, go Rocket Lab. Yeah. Electron launch uh, happened today. Fiftieth launch of the rocket, which you know we're just a few years into this era, well, decade of reusable rockets, but that's remarkable. Yeah, you know it's interesting. Um, the we we uh, Mike Wall over at space.com that who wrote our story for it actually compared this milestone with a few others. So uh, it took um, it took them uh, seven years and one month to fly fifty. Electron rockets. Not a, not all of them succeeded. They had a few failures, um, but uh, SpaceX launched fifty Falcon nines in seven years and nine months. So it took them uh, a few more months uh, than uh, than uh, uh, Rocket Lab and United Launch Alliance took uh, ten years, just under ten years, uh, to to fly fifty uh, fifty Atlas V rockets. And the European Space Agency, not European Space Agency. Um, uh, Ariane Space took 11 years and nine months to oh, I launch. You're going to say has has not yet. Uh, no, okay. uh, to launch to launch 50 uh, Ariane Five rockets. So so they are uh, the new kids, but they are the faster kids, and maybe that's because they've learned from everyone else's uh, work uh, and also more about their their vehicle. Uh, but it is a, a really great um, a really great achievement, and not only that, but uh, they have also. Uh, uh, re, you know, started recovering their boosters to make it more affordable. They're starting a new rocket, a larger rocket called Neutron, which I'm excited about because they are going to launch it uh, into space from Virginia, Wallops Island, uh, five hours from my house. Uh, so I look forward to going and see that thing uh, launch uh, in person, uh, just as I have for Rocket Lab. They do launch them from NASA's Wallops flight facility there as well. Not, not as much recently, but they want to do one a month from there, at least eventually when they scale up. Oh, that's cool. And we should note that SpaceX is well over. They must be into close to, what, 315, 20 launches now? Oh, uh, so, I mean, I'm pretty sure they've flown more than 50 launches this year alone. So, yeah. No, they have. They, I, I think, think they're at like 60 62 now, right? 62 or something, yeah. Yeah, they launched like two this week already, three. And by the way, the, the West Coast launch just the other day was one of the best ever. I, I unfortunately did not see it from the boat where I've got a clear view of the West. I had to see it from the condo, so there are a lot of trees in the way. But you could see the thing slowly arc up, and you actually could see the fairings separate. Mm -hmm. You could see its stage. You could see every stage of the flight. Uh, what I could not see was the first stage uh, burn back maneuver, but that was that was awfully cool. All right. Yeah. And from from the amazing and sublime to the absurd, which is your fixation on the moon. What? It's the what summer a solstice in the full strawberry moon. What the hell is that? Well, no. So I, I just thought it was fun. I mean, as as you and I are recording it, it's the strawberry full moon. It's the first <laughs> full moon of summer because the solstice, the summer, like what that marked the changing of the seasons was yesterday, the day before we recorded this mm. episode. So, uh, so you know, we have a new season. So, huzzah for orbital mechanics uh, and and, and for everyone huzzah? that's everyone that's that's listening south of the equator. Happy winter. I guess right, uh, and uh, uh, and and we have this this first full moon, uh, and we should all enjoy it. Go up and gaze at the moon lovingly, knowing that hopefully in two years astronauts will be walking on its surface and uh, cavorting as they do uh, for uh, all of perpetuity in the future. So, so is this a full strawberry wolf worm? farm animal we, we, beef eating moon or something i mean so you, uh, we we call this one uh the strawberry solstice moon of june oh, that's so. <laughs> that's not and you could add summer in there if you want lyrical it. yeah so, okay um and it, it's funny because my daughter's my daughter's old elementary school which is a block from our house has a strawberry festival every year around this time and we just had it i think a week or two ago so it's all very timely and that was newsworthy in some way because it's a strawberry moon Right. This is when they're. This is when they're in season. Uh, okay. Go okay, get your okay. strawberries, and then look at the moon, and then tell us. Tell us. You know how it looked. You know I want to know. All right. Uh, and finally, I wanted to add, uh, as long as we're talking about headlines in the futurist today. Oh yeah, I saw is, it. Is not not my favorite publication. They're a little clickbaity, but the title of the article was "Tough Week." At least you're not stuck in space. End quote. Parentheses. 
and and uh, this Starliner. This the, the the futurist headline about Starliner was the first headline uh, to come out there to say that the astronauts are stuck in space because they extended the mission, and. And and then uh, in the last three days since they had that press conference earlier this week uh, to announce the delay, uh, several other publications have come out and said, "Oh, and now they're stranded in space." Actually, the future has said stranded in space, uh, and uh, they've all said stuck now. And the the TLDR is that NASA said and Boeing in the press conference that if push came to shove and there was an emergency on the space station, uh, Sonny Williams and Butch Wilmore could get in that, uh, that Starliner and just come home. So it, they're not stuck at all. Their mission is extended while they look at it. They're all stuck means your spacecraft doesn't work at all. And they are not at that point at all. So I was glad that you called that out because it is irresponsible as a headline. Uh, uh, I, I feel, and that's my soapbox for the, for the week. No, they they have a lot of irresponsible headlines, and I it's unfortunate because at first when I saw I, I they weren't even on my radar until about a year ago, and I thought it was uh, uh, fu- futurity, mm-hmm. which isn't as goofball as as futurist if I've got that right, or is it futurity? Maybe I've got it mixed up. But uh, yeah, goofy headline, you get a lot of those. There's a lot of, you know, are aliens living in your bathroom and that kind of stuff. So Asteroid right. the size of 26 llamas, right? <laughs> yes. We'll pass Earth by five feet. All right. We'll be back in a moment with Dave Giles and Emily Carney. Stay with us. All right. We are joined by Emily Carney and Dave Giles of Space and Things, among many other pursuits. Thank you for coming today. And can one of you just lead off by telling us what your podcast is and sort of what your what your intended purpose was when you started it yeah certainly we it, it's the space and things podcast so <laughs> we have space and we have things so we, <laughs> pre- predominantly we have space but we we try and uh find avenues to to make it connect either art popular culture uh, th- those kind of those kind of things, and um, we've been doing it now 200, 200 episodes. Next week, uh, episode two hundred uh, comes out. We've never missed a week. Uh, it started uh, during during COVID, but um, we've been we've not stopped for for some reason, and it's been a, it's been a lot of fun. And, and before we go to Emily, I just want to mention to everybody: Dave is also a gifted musician who performs uh, weekly, apparently, and will be performing immediately after this. And Dave, I was raised in a musical family. My father was a classical musician. My first wife was a classical musician. So um, I vibe with your life. Oh, yeah. Uh, But you're not a classical musician, Rod. (laughs) Hey, hey, I played in high school. Um, No, I'm not. I was was pretty miserable. And Emily... Emily, who I who I will be asking the same question of, uh, wears many hats. She started a huge group we'll be talking about later called Space Hipsters uh, on Facebook and is a space historian and writer and journalist. And we've had her featured in Ad Astra a number of times, magazine I edit, and you do sensational work, especially when you're talking about Jerry O'Neill. So congrats. Thank you. Yeah, thank yeah, you I've so never much. heard of him. <laughs> yeah, I never talk about. He's I that, never talk. About he's that tin cans in orbit guy. <laughs> yeah. All right. So Emily, uh, what was sort of your vision for space and things? Well, um, I love the. It's funny. I, I love the and things aspect of space and things. For example, um, we're about to do our two hundredth. We've we've done our two hundredth episode, and a lot of it focuses. We have a pretty big guest for it. But a lot of the episode focuses on space art, like art, you know, steam, things that things that aren't um, usually associated with space. Most people, when they think of space flight, they think of engineering, they think of scientists. And those are great things, obviously. But um, in the new space economy, people are going to be involved in space that aren't necessarily engineers and scientists. You know, you're going to have writers and artists and people who do those kinds of things. So we try to focus on the and things aspect as well of we've talked to a number of guests um who've done you know more entertainment type things um and we've talked to a lot of writers we've talked to some artists as well uh, musicians even because like i said you know the way things are going now a lot of people have a hand in it it's not just you know one type of person like you know uh, an artist or or 
I'm sorry, an engineer or a scientist or anything like that. You don't have to be this brilliant engineer or scientist to necessarily have an involvement in space flight. And how did you both get involved in space? I know everyone has like a space bug story, like when they got bit by by something. And I assume that you you run the webcast because you love space, not because you hate it and you're trying to bash <laughs> it every week. Uh, but but how, how how did you get involved in that? When was your first exposure to, I guess, the final frontier? Yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting. I was born in 1985 and in the UK. So obviously there wasn't much space stuff going on. Every now and then uh, there'd be a photo in the newspaper if something had happened. Um, but it, it wasn't something that would get coverage uh, on the TV, not on the TV I was watching anyway. Um, but I remember as a kid, I would have been five or six, and uh, we, we were on holiday in, in, in Portugal, of all places. I don't, don't know why Portugal. that sticks in my brain, but we were in Portugal and my mother had had a glass of rosé <laughs> and uh, or two. And she started passionately talking about the Kennedys um, and was it was one of those things that just stuck out. She was so overwhelmed by what could have been. Mm -hmm. uh, if they had both lived and also within that conversation she talked about the moon landing and where they were and how they experienced it and it was just one of those memories which um really grabbed me and i don't know why but it just did yeah. and then two years later we're at kennedy space center obviously it's named after a kennedy and you've got a saturn V rocket there and there was a shuttle on the pad and I think just the, all of those things combined, for whatever reason, it made me go, yes. And then Apollo 13 came out two years later, and that kind yeah. of sealed the deal, really, didn't it, Tom? <laughs> you know, so maybe Tom Hanks is the answer. He's been the answer for a lot of us. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> how about you, Emily? How, how about when was your first uh, space uh, exposure, or your first, the, the first time it hooked you? Um, I honestly have to also credit my mother, um, I remember I, I, well, I was born in 1978 and I grew up um, in Florida, not very far from Kennedy. I was born in Florida and I grew up not really far from Kennedy Space Center. So um, I was very blessed to have sort of a first, you know, a first row seat to the early shuttle program. Um, uh, when I was very young, my uh, mom took me outside uh, and she was like, hey, the shuttle's going up. And I was like, shuttle you know and yeah it was sts2 um <laughs> and yeah i mean just and i remember watching i still remember this it's been i was very little and it's a very long time ago it was geez almost 45 years ago which is insane but um i remember looking you know in the sky and just seeing it curving up into space and i was like oh my god that's a spaceship and there are people <laughs> on it that's wild you know and from that point on i was just obsessed i had to get every shuttle toy. I, I used to go to the library. What's kind of weird. Um, I don't know if it's weird. It's kind of, but a lot of the writers that I, I checked out of the library back then were like British space writers, like Phil Clark and Reginald mm -hmm. Turnell, people like that. So I was really familiar with um, their work from an early age, which is weird. Uh, there weren't, I hate saying this, there weren't many women spaceflight writers at all back then. So I was mainly familiar with people like Phil Clark and Reginald Turnell. So I guess I have to thank them for becoming a space flight writer in a strange way, even though um, it, it's, yeah, it's kind of weird that a, a, a girl in sort of a rural Florida city would be turned onto their work, you know, <laughs> but they were, the, but their books were in the libraries at the time. And I still have um, years later, I bought those books and now they're in my home. So they're still great references. So that's really how I got into space was just, you know, growing up, and I was lucky enough to go outside and be able to just watch this. And I still live in Florida and uh, I, I, this isn't a brag, but I, I still can go outside and watch every launch, which is kind of uh, at least every East Coast launch, which is kind of cool. Yeah, that's so funny. Both of you have mom stories. And my, my mom just texted me today uh, a photo of, of myself, my brother or my sister and my grandmother in front of the Kennedy Space Center Visitors Complex. <laughs> nice. So wait, uh, is that you on the right side? Yeah, although, yeah, Rod's looking at it. I shared it in our little... Look how skinny you Jack. were. <laughs> I was 15 years old. And, uh, 15 years old. And uh -huh. uh, uh, and that was the first time I had ever been to Florida, actually. And then 
when I became cool. I, I, I was going every month. <laughs> so, uh, so mom, mom, moms are the best. She told me it was the best investment she ever made going to space camp uh, uh, down there. So, um, Rod, what, what do you have? What you, <laughs> what's next for you? What's it? What's it? To you, to you. Oh, I know you right. have a burning question about things. I do. I do. Uh, I, I was wondering if you guys could talk a little bit more about the and things aspect, because before we came on, you were talking about how, uh, well, besides your affection for being able to expand the podcast, how that kind of makes you stand apart from most of the other space podcasts out there. Yeah. So I, I think I'll use this week's uh, interview to kind of highlight that. So we had Charlie Duke, uh, Apollo 16, Moonwalker, and his granddaughter, um, Sterling Crawford, who has just opened a new exhib exhibition in South Carolina. And she's done a beautiful portrait of her granddad. And there's a couple of other space artists included in this exhibition. Um, so we, we got to talk to both of them with the idea of it being about space art and when you've got a moonwalk when you're interviewing a moonwalker people think you you're, you're going to ask what it was like on the moon so so on and so forth but we we wanted to do something slightly different with charlie and give him an interview experience that perhaps he hadn't had so i was asking him when you were taking photos did you ever consider that they would be pieces of art mm -hmm. uh, be because you know, look what Andy Saunders has done with Apollo Remastered. I, I'm sure you two are both familiar with that. Um, but that book, he has photos in that book that he took uh, that hang on the wall in many places have been turned into huge exhibition pieces. And I was trying to find out whether they were conscious of the fact that what they were doing was art or was it just matter of fact? And you'll have to listen to the interview to find out what he said. So we got to have a link to that. Uh, <laughs> I, I asked Al Bean a similar question and before he talked about the art in a uh, gushing fashion, he said, well, it was just like the simulations, which is not the answer. <laughs> 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 it was like, what was it like to be there and experience that and know that you'd be painting it? It was just like the simulations. Okay. Next question. Uh, Emily. Um, about the end things aspect, another, another thing that I think is cool is we like to delve into um, stuff that's not necessarily discussed when it comes to some people's careers. I think another example of that, um, we interviewed Fred Hayes a couple, I think a couple of years back. And when we interviewed Fred Hayes, it was like, we everybody knows he was in Apollo 13, right? Everybody's, a lot of people have seen the movie with Tom Hanks and Bill Paxton and Kevin Bacon. You know, most people are familiar with that story. So we were like, man, we want to get, we'd like to get Fred Hayes on the show, but we don't want to just ask questions about Apollo 13 because frankly, he's answered all of them. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, was, were you scared? You know, he's answered most of them. Um, so we were like, let's talk to him about Enterprise, uh, the space shuttle, because he was the first commander of Enterprise. Um, he was really instrumental in developing the entire space shuttle program. And that's something that he hasn't talked about a lot until re more recently. He's done a book and some interviews. Mm. Um, that was not really something he discussed a lot. Just it's something that I feel and I think I can speak for Dave as well. You know, we were like, man, this is kind of overlooked, you know. So we did a whole episode about it and it was just incredible. Like, I think we uncover you know we uncovered some stuff that he hadn't really talked about before in an interview and to me that, that was amazing that's the kind of stuff like i said i can't speak for other others but as a historian that's the stuff i'm obsessed with like hearing stories that wow i have not heard this before this is brand new to me so i i hope that answers the question but i think mm -hmm. that's another part of our and things focus is that we're trying to go for things. And we also, another example, another Apollo astronaut we interviewed was Rusty Schweikert. And we asked him a lot about, you know, things he did beyond Apollo 9 that were maybe he hadn't discussed in detail before. And that was just fascinating. It was a fascinating discussion. And, and I think our listeners love those things too. So, yeah, I, I hope that answered the question. But I kind of look it at does. it as part of and things. I, th yeah. I think if I had Hayes on, I'd want to ask him about his time at Grumman working with those guys on that little fragile, delicate yeah. tissue paper spacecraft, you know, and uh, their faith in them. All right. Well, we'll be back with Tarek's next burning question. He has a burning condition and we'll be uh, back in just <laughs> one moment. Condition. Stand by. Yeah.
You said that you were going to keep my condition to yourself, Rod. I told you that. <laughs> hey, so, it wasn't my fault. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I wanted to ask about some of the guests. You touched about, uh, on some of them, you talked about Fred, uh, Fred Hayes and, and, and Rusty Schweiker. But I'm curious who your favorite guests have uh, that you've, you've had the opportunity to speak with uh, that, that you know, listeners can, can look forward to going back, back and finding. Is there like a, a few standouts that were, you know, like the near and dear to your heart, Dave, Emily, or, or yes. some, some surprising ones where you were like, well, we'll, we'll get this one for this week, but, but, you know, we'll just get through it. And then it ended up being a hidden gem. Mm. I, yeah, I mean, we've covered so many subjects. Um, the, the other part of the things is we, we try and think of a round space. So we've have, had an, episode devote to Lego, to space modeling, autograph collecting. And our interview with Steve Zarelli, who, who's uh, an aut- autograph authenticator, was amazing. Uh-huh. Like, he, he, was, he had some great stories and, uh, uh, about Bill Anders, for example, having four different signatures that he used. <laughs> uh, stuff, stuff you don't expect because he didn't, doesn't like autograph hunters, so he uses four different ones. Uh, it, it's things like that which which I've really enjoyed hearing. Um, but we've spoken to a hell of a lot of astronaut children. Um, mm. That's a that's an area we've really really focused on. Sometimes because we've wanted to learn we should, more about. We should them. clarify that, that you mean like the children of astronauts, not like yes. little baby astronauts. So. <laughs> <laughs> not yet. Well, maybe in the future. Baby astronauts um, being trained to go to space. Yeah. No, just. Yeah. So, so we, we had we've had we've had quite a lot of that. We've done different things with that as well. So, we really wanted to do a kind of MythBuster episode on Scott Carpenter. So, talking to Chris Stover, Stover about that was was amazing. But then we had Rick Armstrong on to talk about the music he makes. Um, so, there, there's many many aspects of this. But also within that, you can say, well, there's a famous photo of your dad playing piano. Was music a big thing at, at, in, in the Armstrong house? Mm-hmm. And him dispelling some myths about, oh, well, that was because Time Magazine came around. He, I don't really remember him <laughs> playing piano at home. Um, so we, we've done plenty of things like that. We have a lot of historians on as well. And p- perhaps our best, consistently best guest would be, in my opinion, is a fellow Brit called Stephen Walker, who yes. wrote a wonderful book called Beyond. Uh, I don't know if either of you have read that. Uh, it was about... Um, the first flight by Yuri, uh, Yuri Gagarin and his level of research is amazing but that man can tell a story he could read <laughs> me the phone book and I would find it interesting um, and we've had him back a few times because his research was was a lot more than Gagarin so we did a Titoff show with him we also did an animals in space episode because he did a lot of research on the, the early animals that were used in space flight um, and that that was Awful, but amazing at the same time. So, so yeah, we, we've covered a hell of a lot of ground, and, and the historians often often have the best stories. We've done about but Emily. Just, what, what, just, what are your just thoughts? Don't ask on about that? Leica, right? <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I really agree with a lot of what Dave said. Um, I love the interviews we've done with the children of a lot of the astronauts, just because it. it um, Another standout is, is is the shuttle, the children of shuttle astronauts like uh, Bruce McCandless III mm. and also uh, Patrick Mullane because uh, the shuttle was so risky, I mean, really. And it's just interesting to get their perspective of, okay, what, it's like, what is it like to watch this as a spectator knowing your dad's on that, you know? Mm. Um, so that was, to me, very interesting because it gives you another – facet of the shuttle program that you may not have thought of, you know, just being somebody like me, who's just a spectator with no real emotional ties, you know, to the, to people on the shuttle. Um, I have to agree totally a thousand percent with Dave on Stephen Walker. Uh, I think the episode on the animals, I had my best facial expression screenshots (laughs) because there were some reveals on that that I screamed at. I mean, it was like Dave said, it was alternately fascinating, but some of it was awful. Then I was like, oh, my God, you know, and um, yeah, and it was a lot of stuff that I honestly hadn't. I'm somebody, you know, I like to do a lot of research. I honestly had no idea about a lot of the stuff. And also he wrote Beyond, um, which is which also won the Space Hipsters Book Prize. Um, and it's just a beautifully, 
I'm trying to say this unbiased, but it's just an amazingly researched book. There was stuff in there that I had honestly no idea about as far as the Soviet space program was involved. And that's something that a lot of Americans did not know about because uh, for years there was sort of a, you know, they'd send something up and, hey, what are you guys doing over there? Nothing. It's called the Cosmos <laughs> mission. Just don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. That's right, right, right. You know, right. And, yeah. All right. Awesome. And I, I mean, I'm, you guys know that, you know, but a lot of younger people might not know that. But I, yeah, back in the day, it was like, hey, what are y'all doing? Cosmos mission. Cosmos right. 1147. <laughs> Come ahead. Yeah. Don't, don't worry about it. We right. just sent something up. You didn't know. Yeah. You didn't know if it failed or what. You know, they just, they just, yeah. So it's really, for me as a Westerner, it's really cool to, you know, for, I know we have tenuous, political issues with that country, but it's cool to learn about their space program. So uh, to me, he's a, and also he's an amazing storyteller as well. I mean, he's not just from a research standpoint, but just, you're like, oh my God, this is amazing. Yeah, uh, we we, ha we have had a, a lot of wonderful guests. We we've tried to do some of the the science stuff as well. Some of the we got, had some of the, the the chief scientists and and some of the CEOs from and, and CEOs of various startup companies. Um, we 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 haven't done many of them in a while, and I think partly is because I see a lot of people doing that. A lot of other podcasts are covering that kind of thing, and. It's it's just trying to, and often we we were doing them because I was getting emails from them saying, "Hey, here's a press release." And when you're doing a weekly podcast and someone delivers something good to your inbox, you're like, "Oh yeah, brilliant, that's right. perfect." Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it's trying to. How do we differentiate ourselves from from other podcasts? I mean, you guys are, are, are probably much better qualified than I am to interview someone about how the Vulcan rocket works and so on and so forth. Every now and then we feel like we have to, we have to go into something like that. But um, I personally try and steer away a little bit from that, even though some of them, some, especially some of the scientists we've had on Emily have been amazing. Um, but, but yeah, that, that, that's uh, another aspect of what we've done. And, and uh, museum curators. I love a museum curator as well. Oh, they, yeah. they've, they've always got some great stories as well. And they're always very passionate people. I wanted yeah. to mention you were talking about the children of astronauts when I was writing my Apollo book in 2019. Well, it came out 2019, but there was a pass 11 that came out 2019. So I thought, how could it be different? I know I'll talk to the children of astronauts. So same instinct you had. And I've told the story on here before, but it bears retelling. I was talking to Andy Aldrin, who's a delight. And he surprised me because he said, well, do you, do you mind if I tell you something I've never told anybody? And it's like, well, yeah, I'm a writer. Of course I don't. He <laughs> says, when my dad was on the moon, you know, I, I wasn't worried because I, I grew up around the engineers that worked on the LEM and helped build the LEM. And I trusted NASA. And I knew they were the best of the best and all that. All I could think about, and he was my age then. So we were both about 11 years old when Apollo 11 landed, just to put it in perspective. And he said, I was watching my, my dad bounce around on the moon and I knew exactly what he was doing. He wasn't, he wasn't playing. He was looking at the soil dynamics when his feet hit the ground, how little pebbles would arc away in the lower gravity and so forth. He said, the primary fear I had, there was a cable between the lunar module and the, the antenna that was transmitting back to earth. And he said, I was terrified that my dad would trip over that ruin the TV signal and it would embarrass me in front of my friends at school. Oh, no. <laughs> and I thought, boy, teenage boys just don't change much, do they? Uh, all right. We're going to go to a quick break and then we'll be right back. So don't go anywhere. Well, I, I have another guest question and uh, I'm sorry to keep hammering. I'm curious if there's a dream guest, uh, Dave, Emily, that you haven't been able to get on the show that you would really want to uh, and, and who, who that might be, you know, and it could be like anybody, like it could be, like someone who's not with us anymore or uh, or someone that might be like really out of touch. So Rod and I were having a discussion about this, I think uh, a few days ago and it was really hard to pick. And I was just curious. Yeah, I want to bring Neil Armstrong in with a seance, yeah. but that doesn't look <laughs> complicated run radio. Uh, so, I got a good answer to this. Yeah. Um, I would like to do a show with, and this, this ties into to what we spoke about earlier with my introduction, with Tom Hanks and Jim Lovell. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, wow. A kind of, what was it like learning how to be Jim? Uh, Jim, did you try and throw him off somehow? Uh, <laughs> did you, did you try and 
That's tell him a little porky or anything like that. I, I just think it would be an interesting discussion. Um, clearly, it's not going to happen, but uh, <laughs> I think that would be that would be a lot of fun. Well, have you asked? Um, not yet. I, I'll be I'll be messaging Tom next week about something he's, else. He's so maybe I'll bring it up. <laughs> That's a hard one. As, as, one, as one does, apparently. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> He's in the UK oh, wow. a lot recently, so maybe. <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, I agree with Dave. That would be freaking amazing if we could pull it off. Um, my dream guest, Dave's going to roll his. You all are going to roll your eyes because you're like, oh, can course. I guess? Can yeah. I guess? Yeah, go right ahead. Go guess. It's Put money on it. <laughs> yep, it would be Jerry O'Neill. Yeah. <laughs> we're still alive. It would be. Well, I've got him right here. <laughs> Jerry, come on in. <laughs> it would be Gerard K. O'Neill, just because. Yeah, I just I I'm I'm a little obsessed. So yeah, I would want to. Um, I've I've interviewed some of the people he's worked with, and I've interviewed some of his family, and that's equally fascinating. But you know, just to interview him and sort of his insights and why he feels that off. Earth habitation is a must type of thing. I think that would be fascinating, but I'll shut up. Now I'm proselytizing. So, yeah. well, actually, I'm glad you brought it up because I think it's time for us to discuss another Jerry O'Neill article if you're interested. <laughs> yes, I would love to. I'm open to that. I think it would be very I'd cool probably... to kind of look at it uh, from a 20. Sorry, I'm doing work on, on online here. Arc. It'd be interesting to look at it from kind of a 20th, 21st century perspective and how our views might have shifted and where he was right. Yeah. You know, cause yeah, I think that was uh, too. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm why, game. And why we don't have those stations yet. Right. So, so <laughs> well, that, that's, that's political and willpower oriented. So um, it's like, Oh my goodness. So of course we get thousands of, of fan mails a week. Well, okay. Couple, but uh, how's your audience reaction been? Cause I, you have this great built in audience from, from hipsters, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But uh, I assume you've had a pretty enthusiastic reception. Emily, do you want to take this or do you want me to? I can take this. Um, we've had, like you said, we sort of have a built-in audience just because of my affiliation with Space Hipsters. Um, but I think we have a pretty good, uh, we do have a Patreon, um, which is really cool. And we, we do have a lot of, I think, positive um, input from the audience. Recent, mm -hmm. Most recently, we did a, a three-part uh, interview series that Rick Houston did with Alan Bean. And we ran those interviews, I think, for the first time ever. And we got a lot of cool insight or input from people and how much they enjoyed it, how much they loved hearing from Al Bean again, because um, it's hard to believe he's been gone, I think, for six years now, which is wild. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I think, you know, we have a great rapport with the audience and um, – What's also been cool is what we've attracted people who are kind of outside space hipsters as well. Um, I've gotten, I, I think Dave can also speak to this. We've gotten messages, for, ugh, if I could talk, messages from people, you know, sort of out of the blue, like, hey, you know, I, I love this. You know, I love how you guys, uh, I, I think we had her on this show, but this was still really cool. Um, we had Chris Marshall from For All Mankind on the show. And um, she plays Danielle Poole, if you watch it, the, the mm -hmm. awesome astronaut. And she left a comment. Um, she left a, a review for us. And yeah, and she and it showed to me that she showed to us that she listened to the show. And that was really cool. So just things like that. So um, we're really blessed. I think we have a cool built in audience. We, we get a lot of good feedback, I think, weekly. So they send you yeah. big checks in the mail? <laughs> yeah, some of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I got, well, I have had a couple of gifts sent to me uh, that didn't have um, any name inside. So I don't oh. know who sent them to me. So they weren't just packets um, of white powder or anything like that, huh? <laughs> no. They, they, have you seen those Eastern Press versions of the astronaut biographies the really fancy leather bound signed mm. limited edition versions that are dead yeah. expensive i got a whole set of them sent to me and i still don't know who sent them um and i feel oh. so so out of the loop here i mean Tark gets free <laughs> stuff all the time because he's an important journalist and i'm lucky if i get the request to renew my dog's identity tag, you know? <laughs> that's pretty cool We've yeah it's great 
We've had a few like um, out of the blue. I mean, and this isn't all. I don't want to make it like we get this all the time. But we've had a few like sort of Patreon donations from like, you know, people who we were like, what? This person donated us, you know, because they want to see the show go on. And mm-hmm. so that's always really kind of like, wow, that that's really an honor that you know, people of this caliber care about the show so much and, and what we do. Yeah. It's, it's, it's quite something quite overwhelming. Some of the, some of the people that have contributed, um, yes. that, I was like, oh, wow. I had no idea that person even was aware what we did, let alone wants to contribute. <laughs> uh, maybe we should have asked them to be on the podcast. Maybe this is a hint. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> mm. uh, yeah. but yeah, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, yeah, the the Patreon thing is interesting. I, I, I you know, we we don't have a um a, any organization behind us. We, it's an independent podcast, so um to to be funded by your audience uh month month on month again is it. I think it's very much vindication that we're doing something right. Um, and it's great to be able to include some of their questions when we interview various people. They sometimes come up with things that we just would not have thought of. Um, so that's really great as well. All right. Well, well uh, we're going to be back with, I, I can see Tarek's queuing up, but we have one more <laughs> ad break to go to. So stand by. I wanted to ask a question that um, I don't know if I have, I know the answer to for myself. Um, and it's come up a couple of times, but you mentioned uh, Dave, Emily about, you know, the rise of commercial space flight of these private missions and that you've had some folks uh, uh, from the private missions on, um, on, 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 on the show. But I'm curious if you would want to go on one of those flights, you know, such as they are now, you know, uh, uh, hitching a ride on, I guess what, what the new Virgin Galactic Delta class, they haven't built it yet, but they're going to, or, uh, or a dragon, which seems the most, uh, you know, Settled is that right? Um, or, or I guess Blue Origin, Origin with, or yeah. Blue Origin with New Shepard uh, as well. I mean, is that something that you've ever thought about, or is it still kind of like you're not interested in flying in space, just kind of watching uh, the the whole thing play out at all? Slam me up. Yeah, yeah. In a heartbeat. <laughs> that was what about the easy. waivers? Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, we had um, a CEO of Think Orbital. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of them. They're, they're trying to build some big structures in space, including some commercial space stations. And they've promised, promised us that we can go when, when <laughs> they, they've done it. So I'm going to hold him to that because he said it in an interview. I've got it recorded. Oh. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm going to hold him to that. <laughs> Hell, I'd be happy just to space camp. How about you, Emily? <laughs> yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd do it. Uh, my, would my family be thrilled about it? No. But I would totally do it. Um, I, yeah, like I said, if we uh, if we could get a ride on Starship or something uh, due to the Think Orbital thing. Uh, seriously, though, I, I would take it. My DNA is in space through mm-hmm. Celestis right now. So there is part of me, I guess, in space. But if they she, if I had a you, chance to actually go see space and see the Earth and experience, I guess, uh, the overview effect and stuff. I, I think that would be amazing. I, w- I would just love, I don't care where I go. I just would like to see the earth from space. That would be <laughs> awesome. Yeah, so you mean literally your DNA is in space, not like, Oh, yeah. it's like, it's Correct. in my blood. It's like, no, you actually put it on a rocket and uh, it's on a, yeah, it's currently in deep space somewhere. Oh. I, I think the last time I looked, it was uh, flying by earth, which is kind of a <laughs> weird thing to say. Cause I, I showed it to my family and I'm like, yeah, here's where I'm at. And they're like, what, what? You know, so in, in, in millions of years, when the aliens clone another Emily to, to understand what space was, we'll We're all in know how it got there. So well, I, I, I feel intimidated now. My DNA is only on this coffee cup. That's the best thing I can offer. That's, that's a good I don't know, though. It may not be a good thing. My DNA is in space. Like like Tariq said, it may be, you know, my alien clone might come back in a, thou- a few thousand years. And I don't know if anybody's going to be thrilled about this. So we'll see. Well, I guess the question would be, is your alien clone going to come back and say, hey, I'm glad to see Space Hipsters has grown to 10 million? Or is it going to come back and say, take me to your leader? Or is it going to come back and say, all right, turn over all the nuclear codes to me. I'm taking charge. <laughs> Which, wow. you know, given the past decade or so, that might be okay. <laughs> I'd vote for you. Since you brought up Space Hipsters, we should ask about that, Rod. Space Hipsters. Let's talk yeah. about Space Hipsters. So this is a group on Facebook that you started in 2011, as I recall, kind of yes. on a whim. 
and mm-hmm. you uh, started with you know, a handful of your friends and and husband perhaps and now last i checked you were i think up to sixty two thousand. yes uh you are correct yeah i started it in 2011 and it really was on a whim i started it it was just as the shuttle program was beginning to to wind down mm. and i was like man you know it'd be cool to have a group about you know just space flight but at the time you know it, it we had four people in it including my husband i did not think it would catch on and at the beginning i just kind of dumped memes in there that i thought were funny they probably weren't that funny but um yeah and i found within a few months we grew to like about 100 members you know of people who are just space enthusiasts and stuff and i was like okay that's cool you know 100 people is good right it's gonna stop there and um within a couple of years or so it just started to blow up like we started to get you know our first thousand members then it went to 5,000 then 10 that it's just grown exponentially from there. Now it's 62,000. I think that was the last time I looked at the count in the group. And I think the attraction to the group is, you know, we do talk about the past, present and future of space flight. Um, I believe I, I believe, and I'm saying this as, um, the founder of the group and I have oversight of the moderating team. We have the best moderators on the planet. Um, they really keep everything in line and, you know, they keep the group respectful and open. Um, we don't allow any hate language in our group. We try to be open to everybody who comes in the group. We have really, we're a big tent group because we try to welcome everybody from all interests in it. And we try to honor the past, present and future, that means, you know, we love the old, we love the cool stuff, the old stuff from back in the day, the Apollo, Gemini, um, Gemini, Gemini. Gemini. Thank you. Gemini. <laughs> this is a, this is an argument. This is an argument <laughs> been having for a while. We love all that stuff, but we also love the stuff that's happening now. So, and we also love the um, uncrewed programs. You know, you've got Voyagers, uh, all the stuff that they're doing at JPL and things like that. So we try to keep it open to all that. I think that's really the key behind our success. Um, the group also has we have a yearly book prize as well and currently there is judging going on uh for the this year's book prize and also we've done quite a bit of charity work uh mainly we've donated we've had charity drives to uh donate to a group called taking up space which sends native american young women to space camp right. we're also currently in the process of trying to establish a nonprofit. i believe it's a 5013c um to uh also we'd like to have our you know, maybe our own scholarships to help students and things like that. We're, but we're in the process of doing that at the moment that establishing a nonprofit is kind of a, a, I wouldn't say a lengthy process, but to, to do it that you, there's quite a bit of paperwork to do it. Yeah. Yeah. It's quite a bit of paperwork and you really have to justify having a nonprofit as well. Like the state isn't going to just issue that to you. So we're in the process of doing that at the moment and all those things so yeah it's grown far beyond my wildest dreams and uh i'm very proud of of the group and i i think we have a pretty good future ahead of us so i'm really proud of what we're doing right now so before you you establish a nonprofit, i would just like to suggest that you consider that one dollar per month per member that you can get from space hipsters as a nonprofit or a for-profit and i'll ask dave do you have a preference no. Okay. Uh, <laughs> then I'll ask my next question. Uh, kind of went kaboom. Uh, did you find Emily through Space Hipsters, Dave? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, that was exactly how I found her. I, I, do, do you know what? If they want to take a profit out of it, let them take a profit out of it. They do a great job in there. It's a wonderful place to, to for people to learn. I, I, I'm just a member of it, so I can. Mm-hmm. I think I can say these things. But, but what they do, the way they try and focus it on helping young people is amazing and i think that's got to be applauded so i i can't imagine they would ever take profit but um no we're not yeah. interested but, in that. but but they could let them because they're doing something I mean, the, the job of moderating a group with that many people mm. is not fun no. i mean that can't be fun <laughs> I, I i couldn't think of anything worse i'd like to do with my time uh moon deniers but, yeah well, exactly Hard and work. the rest yeah yeah, to sorry to talk over you, Dave, but we do deal with certain things that we try to keep 
from the rest of the group. We deal with, I won't get into it, but we do, we'll, we do deal with people who are the moon landing denier people. We deal with a lot of weird stuff. So we try to keep that away from everybody. We don't even want people to see it. We want people to have a good time in the group. We don't want people to deal with it. We're not interested, uh, at least at the moment, in doing anything for profit. Do we have, we do have merchandise and stuff, but typically we don't get a, uh, if I told you how much we made from our Space Hipster shirts and pins, you all would faint. We don't make anything from those. Most of that goes to the company that manufactures them. Yeah. I maybe, I get probably less than $100 a year from that. And that goes back into, you know, basically the group. So yeah, we're not profiting from any of that stuff. <laughs> hey, these days, a hundred bucks a year from a podcast isn't a terrible thing. Not speaking for us, of course, but you know, <laughs> Tarek. Yeah, you know, I I was really curious. the The idea really of well, <laughs> the idea of space exploration. I mean, we've been fans. I think we've pretty much established that we've been like lifelong fans, all of us. Um, but it seems like there is a a, a like a new level of awareness through like, like, like space hipsters on Facebook through social media in particular um, that has created not just one kind of fan club for space or space exploration, or even just for NASA or whatever, but for like all the different types of, uh, of varieties uh, that, that people could get into. If you, if you like space photography, if you like, et cetera. And I'm just curious if you see a need, an ongoing need for, for like the fan club for space or has it reached a level of public awareness that it is as baked in to, um, to social consciousness now, uh, because of just that always connected, uh, status, you know, you can get live pictures from astronauts on the space station, you know, that kind of thing. Um, uh, has it reached that level where it's just, just like another, uh, a, another part of daily life, uh, for, for the public, like, like tracking the latest sports or the weather or something like that. Do we still need a space fan club uh, uh, going forward? I guess is the question there. That's a really great question. I think we, I, I, I'm a little biased because uh, I founded probably one of the biggest ones out there, but I, I think we do need a space fan club. I think, you know, there is a place for a space hipsters um, mainly because, you know, it's surprising, but a lot of people, in the mainstream are still not really interested or well versed in space flight. Like for example, whenever a SpaceX rocket goes up, I, I know people and I'm not dissing them in any way because this isn't a failure on their part, but they'll be like, Oh yeah, the space shuttle went up today. And I'm like, no, the space shuttle has been retired for years and they don't know the difference between spacecraft. And again, that's not really an attack on them because why would they know that? That's not their, they're not, they don't, that's not their in area of interest, but still, you know, it'd be nice if they had a little bit of education on it, you know, um, not as many people probably pay attention as I would think, you know? Um, so I do think there's a place for a, a niche, I guess, a space flight group or something like that. Mm -hmm. I, you know, just for sort of basic education and, you know, um, yeah, like for basic education, I think, because like I said, there are people who still think the space shuttle is going up and that's not a diss. That's more of less, you know, I don't think, you know, the news pays as much attention on it or maybe they don't pay enough attention to the news yeah. or whatever. So I hope that made sense as an I, answer. I yeah, think, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Dave. Go. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it, it's also something to do with finding a place to belong. Mm -hmm. So although... I don't know. I'm not at school. I don't have anyone who's at school right now uh, in in my circle. Uh, I don't have anyone with kids who are at high school or anything like that. Um, so maybe it's different now. But I was the only kid into space. And if I were to start talking about it, I would get like, oh, shut up. Stop it. What are you doing? Yeah, oh, yeah. He's, off. he's off. He's talking about space again. Until fairly recently. And... One of the things that changed was that I found space hipsters and I found a group of people where I could just nerd out about stuff with. And having then met up with these people, either organized events or just randomly, um, when I've been at a museum, I've said, oh, if anyone's in town, let me know. Or, uh, if anyone's near here, I'm going to see the museum at this time. If anyone wants to hang out and, and nerd out. And that 
is an amazing thing when you've when you've had a, a 25 to 30 years of being into something and it happened to be your own little secret kind of thing because no one cares yeah. and then you find a group of people that actually care about it that's amazing that's so I know life affirming to, to hang out with those kind of people. So I think there is still a need for space fan clubs for that, that for that reason, because there's yeah. enough of us who, when we were a kid were picked on for being the nerdy kid. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and, you know, that is a great that, point. And, and I just got, got back from the national space society's annual conference, the ISDC. And I was reminded how much of a tribe that is because I could sit and talk to these people about virtually anything space and by golly, their eyes didn't glaze over and they didn't yes. wish they could <laughs> pretend they were having a stroke just to get away from me. You know, they'd sit there and listen and go, Oh, but here's what I think. I mean, this is fantastic. Sorry, Tarek, you had a point. I jumped in. No, I think, I think it's just, it's just interesting. You know, it's been, uh, uh, over 20 years I've been doing this professionally. And, and I remember in, in university, I did a whole thing about the jet propulsion laboratory, like how the PR department works there. And we had to go off site and make an official request for, for physical materials, you know, and, and it was great. We got all sorts of great posters and stuff like that, but you had to write to NASA to say you were going to come, please. Could I grab some of this stuff? Uh, and then even, uh, even at the start, having to arrange ahead of time to get Betamax tapes so we could have any video at all of the space shuttle missions was, was really difficult. And now it's like, it comes from the ether and we can just all access it. Uh, as easily, it seems like it's a bit, a bit cooler to be that nerd, Dave, than it than it, it might have been when we were quite, kids. Quite possibly, <laughs> quite possibly, but there's still plenty of people my age in my it's circle that don't care. Yeah. You know, so maybe the kids are caring, but there's less people who care of, who are my age to have a a place where when something happens, and I see it on Twitter on my Twitter feed, X feed, whatever I see it on my Threads feed, and I I want to go and talk about it. I know where to go where I then don't have to bug the people that just like, here he goes again. Um, <laughs> I, that's a really good I point. I have one thing to bring up when I don't want to interrupt you, Dave. Are you? Okay. I'm done. I'm not talking over you. Am I? Okay. Um, you know, uh, it, space hipsters is one of the only places I can talk about Skylab and people don't roll their eyes into the back of their skull. I just roll my <laughs> eyes. <laughs> oh, you mean, you mean talking specifically that, about the that mutiny, That tells right? you a lot. That tells yeah. you a lot. No, I talk about Skylab. Like I could talk, like I literally will bore the crap out of my husband. Cause I'll bring up some minutia from Skylab. And I'm like, isn't that cool? And my husband's like, what? Like, he's like, I literally don't, I did not yeah. listen. To I love my husband. In space. He's not into that. <laughs> You know, he's not into that. He's into baseball, which is fine. I have no problem with that. But um, yeah, it's nice to be able to go to a group and talk about geek out over stuff like that. And it's not like, you know, God, what a freak. Why is she into that? You know, it's right. really cool. Yeah, I have to agree. My, my partner, you know, I write a book and I say, hey, you, want to, you know, read this one. Uh, that's OK. So yeah. I have I have to go to my tribe. So So before we go. Uh, David, I have to ask because you're a musician, and as mm -hmm. I, I said, I, I I have close association with many musicians. Best space song. Oh, oh, oh! Because we got Space Oddity, Starman, Rocket Man, Fly Me to the Moon, and a bunch of newer ones. Those are just the ones I could pick out for you know Gen X. But I see, I I never know where where to go because the geeky well, maybe side of yours. Of, well, yeah, maybe mine. The the geeky side of me says something like. Um, go by public broadcast limited or whatever they're, they're, they're great or public broadcast or whatever they were called uh, they've, they've done this thing where they've used all the mission control audio from the Apollo eras and made a song out of it and, and that kind of <laughs> just speaks to me as a geek and uh, yeah I love that but there, there's so many there's so many like I, I, there's so many great songs that mention astronauts or space um, I, I, Life on Mars is probably my favorite. If I had to pick one, I'd probably go with Life on Mars. But it's not really about space, is it? It's just this is their life on Mars. But like, it gets lumped in to, into that discussion. Um, well, any any other thoughts from the, from from the group? Well, uh, John, our, who's on the board, John Slanina, Jamber B says, "Deep Purple Space Truck and Made in Japan version." <laughs> which uh, you know because i don't listen to that stuff i i have no idea it's not brahms 
Yeah, but, Star Trek in was is probably uh, it's got to be up there though, isn't it? Oh, oh, oh that was that was, it was so <laughs> sacrilegious when I first heard it. Um, so it's Klingons us, on the starboard bow, right? <laughs> starboard bow. Life, Jim, but not as we know it. So, so Dave, where are you off to, and what are you performing tonight? Uh, it's just so this is my rent paying gigs, uh, which which is just um, playing other people's songs just out in the Cotswolds. But yeah, the the, the real passion is doing my own stuff. Uh, and soon there is an album coming out. I don't have a release date yet, but um, I've really gone into the geeky side of, of and tried to to bring my my love of space. I have written a song previously about Gene Cern and called "The Last Man on the Moon." Oh, cool. but I've got a whole whole album called uh, called "Onward," which is, was recorded at Abbey Road in Studio Two, where the beat was recorded, all their stuff, and uh, it every every song is about a different mission in the Apollo program, but. I've done it without using the word space, astronaut, moon, uh, any of those things. So, so if you know, you know. If you don't, it should be fairly accessible, which was a lovely writing challenge. So I, um, I, can, I can see a song from you called something like Orange on the Moon, and you could do like a cut-up remix beatbox, whatever it's called, using the lyrics from um, Cernan and uh, Schmidt on Apollo 17 <laughs> saying, it's orange. That's orange soil. Yeah, look at it. No, I did it with my foot. It's orange. Yeah, that's the kind of stuff I love. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Cool. <laughs> Emily, you got a favorite? Oh gosh. Uh well, I like uh I'm a little biased. I got I like Dave's song about the last man on the moon. That sounds uh, beautiful. Yeah. Oh geez. Um there's also okay, this is really I, I, I would have to go on YouTube to find the name of the band. But there's some like Belgian jazz group in the '70s who did a song called Skylab. I'm a little biased. <laughs> so that's another yeah, it's some. I forgot what the name of the group is, but it was a Belgian. Oh, I think the name jazz. of the group is called Mutiny in Space, Emily. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, was, Just here we go. go there. Yeah, I walked into there. There. <laughs> <laughs> I walked into it. It's okay. Yeah, no, nah, um, yeah, and anything by David Bowie, Moon Age Daydream yeah. is also mm. is one of my top space songs of all time. I, I think I'd have to say the most memorable space song for me was watching William Shatner sitting with a cigarette speaking Rocket, Rocket Man. Man. Yeah, yeah, I was going to mention mean, that one. Not singing, That's so good. Speaking it. And in, in the inimitable Shatner, much delayed verbiage style yeah that's great <laughs> well, the, uh, another honorable mention i think to uh walking on the moon by the police oh, is a yeah, great that's... song and the fact that they did make that video uh on the saturn 5 rocket at kennedy space center where stuart copeland's basically playing the drums on the uh, on one of the engines it's amazing it's just like yeah it was amazing oh, until the moment when you got your stomach clenched up saying, get your drumsticks off Make my so. rocket <laughs> Well, listen, everybody, I want to thank you for joining us today. This has been a thrill. This is long overdue. We are so glad you're able us. to come, come chat with us. And Emily, let's uh, pick up on that article. I can't wait. Absolutely. And sounds great. This has been episode 116 of This Week in Space, the Spreading the Good Word edition. Don't forget to check out space.com, the websites, and the name, and the National Space Society, of course, to satisfy your spaceflight cravings. Um, for both of you, where is the best place for us to follow your misadventures? Um, for me, well, space hipsters, go, yeah, space hipsters, yeah. I would, I do have a a regular, uh, I do have an author's page on Facebook. Mm. I'm on pretty much every social media you can find. Uh, probably space hipsters is the best place to find me. I'm Emily Carney. I believe it's facebook.com slash group slash space hipsters. Cool. Yeah, I, I would just say head over to space and things podcast.com and uh, on there you'll find social links for the podcast and for Emily and myself personally as well. So pick your, the, the social media of your choice, be it LinkedIn, Bebo, uh, MySpace. Is there a, a virtual hat at anywhere we can drop dollars in besides Patreon, or is that the best place to go? Yeah, it's also on our website, there is a there is a direct donation button on there as well. Okay, yeah. Tarek. Uh, you can find me at space.com, as always, on the Twitter or X at Tarek J. Malik. Actually, this month is our one-year anniversary at Spacetron Plays. 
on YouTube, which is really exciting. So uh, uh, if you like video games, uh, you, you can you can find me there. And I have to apologize to all you listeners out there. I will be on vacation the next couple of weeks. So Rod is in the captain's chair uh, for good. And I will see you all uh, from the other side of the world when I get back. What's so. that sound? I hear cheering in the distance. I don't what? <laughs> what? Just kidding. I'm going to miss everyone. Uh, well, I miss you already. And you can find <laughs> me, of course, at pilebooks.com, my increasingly aged website, or at astromagazine.com, where subscriptions and such are available. Remember to drop us a line at twist at twit.tv. That's T W I S at twit.tv. We love getting your comments. We respond to them and we read the best ones on the air. Uh, and even sometimes not the best ones. New episodes of this <laughs> podcast published every Friday on your favorite podcatcher. So make sure to subscribe, tell your friends, and give us reviews, thumbs up, whatever you got. And don't forget, all the great programming on the Twit Network can be found on Club Twit with some extras that you're not going to find anywhere else. Come on, it's seven dollars a month. Send seven bucks a month to Emily and Dave, and then send seven bucks a month yes. to Club Twit. Just wanted to mention that. But uh, <laughs> hey, we, we need your support, just, so step up yes. and be counted. And don't forget, you can follow the Twit Tech Podcast Network at Twit on Twitter and on Facebook. Oh, sorry, at Twit on X. That doesn't sound as quite as, as rhyming, does it? And on Facebook and Twit.tv on Instagram. Thank you, everybody, and we will see you next week.